The subject of today's session is the second part of Isaiah chapter 10. Bearing in mind, as you know, that we appended the first four verses of chapter 10 to our discussion of chapter 9, as we'll see, the last part of chapter 10 we'll be discussing together with chapter 11, the middle part of chapter 10 is a subject in and of itself that on the one hand is very obviously grounded in the historical circumstances of the prophet Isaiah and his times. And of course, on the other hand, has I think a critically important message to us. This middle part of chapter 10 can be summarized under one heading, and that is the destruction that is ultimately being meted out to the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire that is, as we see in the opening verse in our discussion, chapter 10, verse 5, the rod of God's anger. And its destruction essentially is the rod that is smitten, which I think has, as we'll see, great implications, not only in understanding what the prophet Isaiah tells us about Assyria, but what he's telling us about each and every one of us. So it's on that note that we embark upon our discussion of these passages and everything that inevitably emerges from them. Beginning, as we already noted, chapter 10, verse 5. Woe unto Assyria, the rod of my anger, in whose hand, as a staff, is my indignation. So again, Assyria has been charged with a mission by God. As we read in verse 6, I do send him against an ungodly or hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath, the people who are the objects of my wrath, who are being punished by the onslaught of Assyria. Against the people of my wrath, do I give him a charge to take the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. So this is all a serious mission. And yet, verse 7, Howbeit he means not so, neither does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. And that inevitably is problem number one. While Assyria is the rod of God's anger, Assyria isn't engaging in that which it does for the glory of God, but rather for its own self-aggrandizement because of a desire to destroy, to cut off nations, not a few. There is a second problem, and that emerges from verse 8, for he said, are not my princes, all of them kings? Which, of course, has a technical aspect. If all of my princes deserve to be kings, I need to conquer other nations in order to install my princes as kings over them. But there's also a much more basic message that pertains to the arrogance, the pride of Assyria. And indeed, it is in that vein that we read in verses 9 and 10 how Assyria gloats 
over its conquests of other nations. And after listing these various conquests, Kalno, Karkamish, Hamat, Arpad, Samaria, and Damascus, we read in verse 11, Shall I not, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? But now, of course, implicit in the boasts of Assyria here is that Assyria, pagan nation that it is, it doesn't distinguish between worshipping idols and worshipping God. It simply is another battle to be waged, another nation to be conquered. And the consequence, in verse 12, Wherefore it shall come to pass, that when God has performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, alternatively we can render this, when God has destroyed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem. In other words, once Assyria has achieved precisely what God decreed that Assyria was to achieve. I will visit the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. For he has said... By the power of my hand, I have done it. And by my wisdom, for I have understood in that I have removed the bounds of the peoples and have robbed their treasures and have brought down as one mighty the inhabitants. And there's note here, both the pride, the arrogance on the one hand and the desire to destroy, to vanquish. My hand has found as a nest the riches of the peoples, and as one gathers eggs that are forsaken, have I gathered all the earth, and there is none that moved the wing or that opened the mouth or chirped. In appreciating just what Isaiah intends by this description of the pretensions of Assyria, it's helpful for us to consider not only our chapter, but also what we read in chapters 36 and 37. There, we read the historical account of Rab Shakeh, the emissary of Sennacherib, of King Sancheriv of Assyria, coming to Jerusalem. Beginning in chapter 36, verse 4, Rab Shakeh said unto them, that is unto the emissaries of King Hezekiah, King Chizkiyahu, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein you trust? I said, It is but words of the lips, for counsel and might are needed for the war. Now on whom do you trust that you have rebelled against me? First, in verse 6, in mocking the trust of Judah, there is reference to the reliance upon that old and not especially reliable ally, Egypt. But much more significantly, in verse 7, if you say to me, we trust in God our Lord, Is not that he, whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and has said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall prostrate yourselves before this altar? Now, of course, in order to understand the meaning of the taunt, we need to place ourselves in the pagan mindset in which more is inevitably better. So if... King Hezekiah has eliminated all of the many altars that had been built up round about Jerusalem, 
then that signifies diminishing service of God. Well, of course, we know that the opposite is the case. That on the contrary, it was an act of dereliction to allow all of these altars, which God in the Torah explicitly forbade. More is not better. We serve God only upon the one altar in the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. So in this vein, well, we can excuse Rav Shaker for getting it wrong. He never studied theology based upon the Bible. What is more significant for us to note here, however, is an implicit, even glaring, inconsistency. Note, in verse 7, Rav Shaker comes across as the great defender of God, whom, as he presents it, Hezekiah has affronted by eliminating all these many authors. And this theme, after the additional pretentious taunts of verses 8 and 9, returns even more directly in chapter 36, verse 10. And am I now come up without God against this land to destroy it? God said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. The implication being very directly that Assyria is conscious of its having a mission that was given it by God. Yeah, but then we continue in chapter 36, and here Rav Shaker is crying out in a loud voice in the Jews' language so that everyone in besieged Jerusalem can hear his taunts. Verse 14, Thus says the king, Let not Hezekiah beguile you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in God, saying, God will surely deliver us. This city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. And indeed, why should we not trust in God? Skipping to verse 18. Have any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? And there's a list of the various so-called deities. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sfarvayim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? And so on and so forth. In other words, while beforehand, Rav Shaker gloats that he is coming on behalf of God, who has bid the Assyrian Empire to come up and destroy Judah and Jerusalem. Now he says, we're stronger than God. We vanquished all the other gods. We'll vanquish this God as well. And even more explicitly, in chapter 37, the second round of taunts here in verse 10, let not your God in whom you trust beguile you. Don't trust God that Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. And once again, verse 12, have the gods of the nations delivered them? which my fathers have destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Rezef, the children of Eden that were in Tel Asar. And of course, to that extent, the recurrent message, even though initially there was this pretension of coming on behalf of God, we're not afraid of everyone. We're not afraid of anyone. We are stronger than them all the arrogance, the pride to which Isaiah refers, of course, in our chapter, in chapter 10, as well. And given the continuation of our chapter, after Isaiah responds, 
in verse 15. Should the axe boast itself against him that hews with it? Should the saw magnify itself against him that moves it? As if a rod should move them that lift it up? Or as if a staff should lift up him that is not wood? That is, just whom do you presume to dominate? You are merely the axe, the saw, the rod, in the hands of God. And indeed, in much this thing, the response that God sends through Isaiah to King Hezekiah. In chapter 37, beginning in verse 22, this is the word that God has spoken concerning Sennacherib. The virgin daughter of Zion has despised you and laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at you. Whom have you taunted and blasphemed? And against whom have you exalted your voice? Yea, you have lifted up your eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel. By your servants, you have taunted God. Claim that you can dominate everyone and everything. And the continuation. In chapter 37, verse 28. But I know you're sitting down and you're going out and you're coming in and you're raging against me. Because of your raging against me, and for that your uproar is come up into my ears, therefore will I put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way by which you came. In verse 33, therefore thus says God concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come unto this city, nor shoot an arrow there, Neither shall he come before it with shield, nor cast a mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come unto this city, says God. For I will defend this city to save it, for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. I can't help but share with you that when I have the blessing to accompany groups of Bible believers here in our holy city, take them from the sound site of Mount Zion to the Holy Wall before Shabbat, one of the places that I like to show people is what's called nowadays the Broad Wall. The remnants in the old city of the wall that was built by King Hezekiah as part of the defenses of Judah against the siege of Assyria. And I share with them these verses from Isaiah chapter 37, in particular in verse 33, nor shoot an arrow there because the only Assyrian arrowhead that has been found in the land of Israel is wedged between the stones of this wall of King Ezekiel. The arrow reached the wall. It never got inside. He shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there. Indeed, I will defend the city to save it. And returning to our chapter, it is in that vein that Isaiah continues in verse 16. Therefore, will God, the God of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness, and in the place of his glory there shall be kindled a burning like the burning of fire, and the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars 
in one day. In one day. Returning to chapter 37, verse 36. And the angel of God went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when men arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses in Jerusalem. Saved. And returning to our chapter then, after this rout of the great and proud army of Assyria and the glory of his forest and his fruitful field he will consume both soul and body and it shall be as when a tree ground to dust by worms and the remnant of the trees of his forest shall be few that a child may write them down utter destruction and once again I'm going to stress there were those two aspects that were manifest in the words of the Assyrian emissary of Rav Shaket, to which Isaiah in our chapter alludes the lust for destruction the desire to meet out suffering to destroy to ruin others and the arrogance the pridefulness the blasphemy now it's important for us to stress this point god's problem as it were with the blasphemous pretensions of assyria is obviously not because God has been personally insulted. We, of course, need to bear that in mind. That is manifestly not the issue here. When we consider the blasphemous pretensions of Rav Shaka and Sennacherib, it's not an issue of ego that is at the root here. The only one who is wronged by these prideful boasts is the person who is making them. When we consider what God signifies for us, God represents absolute goodness, absolute righteousness, absolute justice, absolute truth. Glorifying these is at the root of our making our lives meaningful. Denigrating, derogating God is making light of that which makes life meaningful for all of us. And so, when we consider what is so wrong in the egotistical boasts of Assyria, we could well take advantage of verses 22 and 23 in chapter 9 of Jeremiah. Thus says God, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glories, glory in this. What a glory. This is what warrants real glorification. That he understands and knows me. That I am God who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says God. Again, it is the glorification, not merely, of God in some abstracted sense, but the glorification of goodness, righteousness, justice, truth, everything that is truly of abiding value. 
as Syria has demonstrated an utter lack of that appreciation. While, of course, inevitably, this is the obvious theme that is emergent in our passage in Isaiah, obviously there are additional dimensions that demand our consideration. Perhaps most glaringly, there does seem to be a tension, a tug of war, if you will, between, on the one hand, Assyria demonstrating its arrogance, its sinfulness, its decadence. And on the other hand, remember, the rod of God's anger. So which is it? Is Assyria acting on its own, or is it acting on behalf of God? And of course, inevitably, this entails our considering some territory that we've already had an opportunity to explore in the past, but an additional dimension as well. So first, by way of brief review, because this is something that we have discussed previously, with respect to the evil that Assyria portrays in the world, what is its source? We read in Isaiah chapter 45, in verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I am God who does all these things. And similarly, in Amos chapter 3, verse 6, shall evil befall a city, and God has not done it. And likewise, essentially the same rhetorical question in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 38, out of the mouth of Most High, Proceed not evil and good? Doesn't everything come from God? And of course the answer is yes. There is no other source. God is the only source. The only source of everything. And we've got at this point in the past, it is in much the same vein critical for us to recall that the biblical concept of Satan, the Satan, is simply part of the heavenly retinue, an angel that presents himself before God. As we read in the book of Job, in chapter 1, verse 6, and in chapter 2, verse 1, the angels of God came to present themselves before God, and Satan came also among them to present himself before God. He, like the rest, is simply a servant with a mission, but only a servant, not a source. So to that extent, on the one hand, we do indeed recognize that there is only one source, God, for both good and evil. And yet simultaneously, that obviously is not intended to imply that we are merely automatons. Because the greatest gift, arguably the greatest gift of all, that God gives us by giving us our humanity is responsibility. The ability to choose. This is so foundational a theme We couldn't possibly recount all the examples of it in Scripture. But just to note very briefly, passages in Deuteronomy chapter 11 and chapter 30. In chapter 11, verse 26, Behold, I said before you this day a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you hearken unto the commandments of God your Lord, which I command you this day, and the curse, if you don't. But it's up to you. And likewise, in chapter 30, verse 15, See, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command you this day to love God your Lord, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances. And then, all the blessings. You shall live, multiply, and God your Lord will bless you in the land 
into which you are coming to possess it. Verse 19, I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, choose life. Therefore, choose life isn't a truism. It isn't an inevitability. It's almost a plea. God is saying, I've given you both alternatives. Choose well, choose life. But it's up to you to make that choice. God doesn't constrain us to one alternative or the other. So, of course, considering the sources we've just seen together, we have an inevitable tension. Everything comes from God, and yet we are free. So, how indeed do we reconcile these two? If we're free, isn't it coming from us? And, of course, the answer is, it is, and it isn't. It is because our moral choices are indeed our own. It isn't in that the ultimate consequences in the grand scheme of God's plan are up to God. As aptly expressed in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, a man's heart devises his way, and it's all up to him. But God directs his steps what eventually, ultimately, will take place. Likewise, in chapter 19, verse 21, there are many thoughts, vices, in a man's heart, that the counsel of God, that shall stand. The thoughts, the devices, those are up to you. What ultimately stands, that is up to God. As an apt illustration, what Mordechai says to Queen Esther in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, when Esther indicates her reluctance to come immediately before the king in order to plead on behalf of her people, if you altogether hold your peace in this time, then will relief and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will be lost. In other words, with respect to the divine plan, God will take care of things. Irrespective of what you choose to do or not do, the grand drama unfolding in the world will inevitably include within it the salvation of the Jews because relief and deliverance can arise from another place. But you and your father's house will be lost if you don't rise to the challenge that God has given you here because that's the domain of your choice. And as we've discussed at many previous opportunities as well, that amounts to saying that on the one hand, you can choose to ally yourself with God's plan. And by so doing, you will advance that plan. And you will also advance your own personal salvation because that salvation takes place through the manner in which you become a conduit in God's plan, God's blessings coming into the world. And the alternative the alternative is one who decides 
to oppose God's plan, to do his utmost, to thwart God's plan by choosing the path of evil, the path of wickedness. Ironically, he too will advance God's plan. Because no matter what we choose, we can never choose to be irrelevant or even insignificant. God put us in the world for a reason. And through our choices, one way or another, we will advance God's plan. The great cosmic drama that God writes for the world. But if the choice that we make is one of being a conduit of destruction, the one consequence that we will ensure is the destruction of ourselves. As we've noted in the past, in much this vein, we read literally in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 8, when you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet for your roof. That you not bring a liability of blood upon your house. Literally, if the faller falls from there, if you don't put the railing around the roof, the faller will fall from there. The faller will fall from there. That's, after all, what the text actually states, even though the more conventional, if less precise, translation renders it if any man falls from there. But what's meant by if the fuller falls from there? Well, simply this. That falling is already decreed. For whatever reason. As expressed in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4, who has wrought and done it? He that called the generations from the beginning. I, God, who am the first and with the last and the same. God has determined this person is a fuller. So, if God determined that he's a fuller, then why bother putting the railing around the roof? No, 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 no. That has to do with your choices, your responsibility. What will happen in God's plan unfolding in the world is God's business. The choices that you make are your own. And indeed, in that vein, in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 10, we have admittedly an enigmatic verse that is open to a number of possible interpretations and translations. The one that I present here that certainly conforms to the words and conforms to what we're discussing presently is... Great is he who performs all, alluding to the great playwright who writes the script. That's God. And while God writes the script, he's also the casting director. He hires the fool and he hires transgressors. He hires everyone. Everyone has a role to play in that drama that is unfolding. And of course, inevitably, the question is going to be, what role we play? So, Assyria is indeed the rod of God's anger. That is the role that Assyria plays in the world as we see in our passage in chapter 10. The question inevitably is, okay, granting that Assyria is the royal of God's anger, what bearing does that have on Assyria's moral choices and their consequences? Because throughout history, we find an ongoing succession of nations charged with missions. Knowingly so, or not knowingly so. With respect to Assyria, the taunts 
of Rav Shaker leave us wondering, did the Assyrians really believe they had been sent by God? Or did they really believe that they were stronger than God? And of course, historically, it's hard for us to answer that question. But it is instructive for us to consider, at the very least, very briefly, some other tantalizing illustrations of this principle of nations having their missions given them by God as we find them in the Bible. A particularly apt example, in a positive way, is what we read in Isaiah chapter 45. Now, we already noted that in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, we read explicitly, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I am God who does all these things. God does all these things. And yet, at the beginning of the chapter, this is indeed the context of those words in verse 7, we read, Thus says God to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open the doors before him and the gates may not be shut. The words of Isaiah predating Cyrus by many decades indicate that Cyrus is given a mission by God. A mission, as expressed in verse 4, for the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen. I have called you by your name. I have surnamed you, though you have not known me. Likewise, in verse 5, I am God and there is none else. Beside me there is no God. I have girded you, though you have not known me. So, of course, the straightforward implication is that Cyrus has a mission, and Cyrus doesn't even know it. And simultaneously, just before Isaiah chapter 45, at the end of chapter 44, we read about God. God says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall complete all my desire. Even saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built into the temple, my foundation shall be laid, it shall be founded. This is part of the mission of Cyrus. Does he know it? Or not? The truth is that the implication in the opening words of the book of Ezra, and likewise in the final verses, in the second book of Chronicles, the implication is that he does know it, or at least eventually he will know it. At the beginning of the book of Ezra, God roused the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth has God, the God of heaven, given me, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whosoever there is among you of all his people, his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of God, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And he summons everyone to help to contribute to this effort. He restores to Jerusalem, to the temple that is being rebuilt all of the holy vessels that had been taken out of the first temple when it was sacked by Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor of Babylon, and he restores them to the temple being rebuilt. The mission of Cyrus, God's anointed. In the Hebrew, Meshicho. God's Messiah. Of course, Messiah literally just means anointed one. 
But it's significant to note. Gentile king described by the prophet Isaiah as God's anointed because he has a mission with which God charges him. This, of course, is on a positive plane. But simultaneously, it's also as the instrument of divine retribution to be meted out to Babylon. And inevitably, in the broad historical context, we recognize something of a message of succession here. Kingship, dominion, that God deposits successively in the hands of many different nations as his proxy in doing his will. Perhaps a particularly apt illustration of this emerges in Genesis chapter 15. God's covenant with Abraham that includes the prophecy in verses 13 and on, God said to Abram, know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Verse 14, on the one hand, that nation, which of course, in retrospect, we realize is Egypt, has been charged with a mission. And yet, and also that nation, whom they shall serve, will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. The fact that this nation that is to subjugate Israel has been tacitly charged with the mission by God does not excuse them or exempt them from divine judgment afterward in evaluating their deeds. Conversely, with respect to Israel itself, Israel, after the Exodus, returns to the land of Israel. There are, are indigenous nations that are present there. We read in verse 16, and in the fourth generation they shall come back here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. That is, once the iniquity of the Amorite will be full, which God, transcending the bounds of time, knows will be the case by this time, Israel likewise is charged with a mission, just as Egypt serves as the whip of divine punishment of Israel in the Egyptian exile, so too Israel will be the whip of divine punishment against the indigenous nations, the Amorites, who, by the time Israel returns to the land of Israel, will have lost their right to being here by dint of their own depravity. This, we read explicitly later on in Deuteronomy chapter 9, in verses 4, 5, and 6, we are given a warning. Speak not you in your heart after that God, your Lord, has thrust them out, the nations, from before you, saying, for my righteousness, God has brought me in to possess this land. Not so. Whereas, for the wickedness of these nations, God does drive them out from before you not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart do you come in to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations, God your Lord does drive them out from before you, and that he may establish the word which God swore unto your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. You serve as an instrument, likewise, in God's hand. This is a message that has attendant to it, inevitably, a dire warning that we read, first place in the Bible where the threat of exile is dangled over our heads. In Leviticus chapter 18, and likewise in chapter 20, 
in chapter 18 and verse 24, defile not yourselves in any of these things, the various abominations of sexual immorality and idolatry. For in all these, the nations are defiled, which I cast out from before you. And that's the reason they are being driven out. The land was defiled, therefore I did visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land vomited out her inhabitants. And therefore, watch it. Verse 28, that the land vomit not you out also when you defile it, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. Same message in Leviticus chapter 20. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my ordinances and do them, that the land where I bring you to dwell therein vomit you not out, as it did to the nations that came before you. You come into the land, but it's based upon that condition of the divine bestowal of dominion. A mission that on the one hand entails being the whip against those who have earned their chastisement. And on the other hand, your responsibility to avert the same fate by the choices that you make. Now, with respect to Israel's bondage in Egypt, when we ask, upon what basis are the Egyptians punished if they were merely following orders? We read at very great length, we don't have time to elaborate excessively, but we read at great length of what the Egyptians did to Israel. Beginning in Exodus chapter 1, when Pharaoh says, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and they set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to be enslaved with body-breaking labor. And finally, in the progressive sequence of dehumanization and disenfranchisement, in verse 22, Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river. And perhaps as an extra dose of outrage, what we read in Exodus chapter 5, it's significant to note that this passage essentially comes right before the sequence of plagues that destroy Egypt, and then ultimately lead to the Exodus. When Pharaoh commands, in Exodus chapter 5, verse 7, you shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tale of the bricks, which they did make heretofore, you shall lay upon them, you shall not diminish aught thereof. Let them work harder. Verse 9, let heavier work be laid upon the men that they may labor therein and let them not regard lying words. And what follows, as we read it in verse 12, the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. And the taskmasters were urgent, saying, fulfill your work, your daily task, as when there was straw. And the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten, saying, Wherefore have you not fulfilled your appointed task in making brick, both yesterday and today, as heretofore? I feel compelled to share with you the tradition that we have. In helping to understand why, when the train of redemption is about to leave the station. The plagues are about to begin. Why this seemingly gratuitous extra dose of misery, of suffering, was brought upon Israel? In our tradition, an ancient answer is offered in the Midrash, that God, as it were, in his court 
of uncompromising justice as a problem. It is indeed time for the train to leave the station, for the plagues to begin, for Israel ultimately to be redeemed. But for now, all the Egyptians will have just cause in complaining about the affront to divine justice that they're all suffering because of the sins of Pharaoh. They didn't do anything to earn this. So, by consequence of this episode, now Pharaoh says, I'm not giving them any more stubble to use as the straw in the bricklaying, and they need to find stubble. So they scatter themselves all over the land of Egypt, and wherever they go, even though stubble, straw, are really owners of property, no one has anything to do with it, the moment that they would attempt to gather any, the Egyptians, wherever they were, would chase them off their property and start beating them up. How dare you come onto my field in order to take this ownerless waste product for your bricklaying? And from our perspective, as mere mortals, we see the gratuitous suffering. From God's perspective, now everyone in Egypt has made him and herself culpable by becoming accomplices to this extra dose of gratuitous suffering brought upon Israel. Now, what's the implication of all this? Again, it all comes back to those words that were expressed way back in the time of Abraham. Chapter 15, verse 14 in Genesis, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. In other words, sure, there's a mission. And Egypt, in that regard, could have conceivably been deemed worthy of the appropriation of God's mission in serving as the faithful instrument for bringing this divinely ordained affliction upon Israel. But that's not what they did. They rather saw it as an opportunity to torment. They weren't doing it in order to faithfully execute a divine mission. And by consequence, also that nation, they shall serve, will I judge. And of course, inevitably, in much the same vein, we consider the implications not only with respect to Egypt, we consider it with respect to that other servant who was designated by God. In Jeremiah chapter 25, in verse 9, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says God, and I will send unto Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about, and I will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolations. Just as Assyria in its time, so Babylon in its time. Assyria, the rod of God's anger. Babylon, its king, Nebuchadnezzar, is described as God's servant. We see the same expression here in Jeremiah chapter 27. And now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. But of course, inevitably we recognize is not explicit in these passages in Jeremiah, is the extent to which Nebuchadnezzar was aware that God regarded him as God's servant in fulfilling God's mission. But the truth is that we have a couple of tantalizing indications that he was aware. In Jeremiah chapter 40, after Jerusalem has been taken, 
we read that Nevuzar Adan, the chief of the slaughterers, chief executioner of Babylon, takes Jeremiah and says to him, God, your Lord, pronounced this evil upon this place. And God has brought it and done according as he spoke, because you, the nation of Israel, have sinned against God and have not hearkened to his voice. Therefore, this thing has come upon you. This is what Nebuchadnezzar's chief executioner is saying. And it's not merely being stated for rhetorical purposes. Since he recognizes that Jeremiah is the faithful prophet of God who has charged the Babylon with this mission, he says to him in verse 4, Now behold, I loose you this day from the chains which are upon your hand. Do whatever you want. If it seem good unto you to come with me to Babylon, come, and I will look well unto you. But if it seem ill unto you to come with me to Babylon, forbear, behold, all the land is before you. Wherever it seems good and right unto you to go, go. In other words, I respect you as the faithful prophet of the God who sent us, Babylon, to destroy Judah. And in a somewhat different vein, but much the same theme, in Daniel chapter 5, when Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, sees the terrifying image of the hand writing upon the wall, and Daniel comes to explain the writing. Daniel says in, da in Daniel chapter 5, verse 18, O you king, God most high, gave Nebuchadnezzar your father the kingdom and greatness, glory and splendor. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all the peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened, that he sinned willfully, he was deposed from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. Verse 22, And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. And you took the holy vessels of the temple, and you used them in your banquet. Verses 24 and on, Then the palm of the hand sent from before him, and this writing was inscribed, and this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Ufarsin, this is the interpretation of the thing, Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you are weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Peras, the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And that night, Belshazzar is killed. You knew you had a mission. You weren't faithful to it. That is one aspect of the dereliction that is as expressed likewise in Isaiah chapter 47 with respect to the Babylonians, the Chaldeans. In verse 6, says the prophet, I was wroth with my people. I profaned my heritage and gave them into your hand, the hand of the Chaldeans, of the Babylonians. You showed them no mercy upon the aged. You very heavily laid your yoke. The wickedness, the gratuitous cruelty, that's not part of executing a divine mission. That's because of deeply rooted godlessness that you put in your heart. And together with that, because these are really inseparable. In verse 7, you said, forever shall I be mistress. The arrogance, the pridefulness. When you said, in verse 8, I am and there is none else beside me. 
I shall not sin as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. That arrogance, that sense of invulnerability, goes hand in hand with the wanton cruelty, because I'm not subject to any limits at all. Again, we reiterate, glorifying God means glorifying goodness, righteousness, justice, truth. Turning your back upon God. Preening yourself in the arrogance, the boasts of having the might to do whatever you please becomes very readily an excuse for doing whatever you please. Wanton cruelty. Unlimited wickedness. Again, that slogan repeated in verse 10, I am, and there is none else beside me. And the consequence? In verse 11, yet shall evil come upon you. You shall not know how to charm it away, and calamity shall fall upon you. You shall not be able to put it away and destruction shall come upon you suddenly, before you know it. And the theme, again, repeated in Jeremiah chapter 25, with respect to the Babylonians, that on the one hand, recall that it was in Jeremiah chapter 25 that we read of the role of Nebuchadnezzar as the servant, the one who is sent to execute God's mission with respect to nations. I will send unto Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, in verse 9. But there also, it was to serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Seventy years, we read there, in verse 11. And indeed, what happens at the end of those 70 years? In verse 12, it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished, that I will visit upon the king of Babylon and that nation, says God, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it perpetual desolations. You had your mission. But were you doing what you were doing, indeed, in fulfillment of this mission? Or you're doing it as an expression of that inner corruption that led you to appropriate for yourself the pretensions of standing in lieu of God. And by consequence, again, becoming the object of precisely the same sort of relentless destruction for which previously you yourself had ironically been the instrument. It's significant to note that in the final two chapters of Jeremiah, prior to chapter 52, which is essentially recapping the history that we read at the end of the Book of Kings, in chapters 50 and 51, we read this message relentlessly. After the bulk of the book of Jeremiah pertains to the delivery of Israel into the hands of the Babylonians, in these last two chapters, we read precisely about the end of Babylon. And here too, it isn't really the end of Babylon. It is the one comes precisely to replace Babylon as the instrument of God's wrath, which now is directed against Babylon itself. In chapter 50, verse 9, For lo, I will rouse and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against her. 
from thence. She shall be taken, their arrows shall be as of a mighty man that makes childless. None shall return in vain, and Chaldea shall be a spoil, all that spoil her shall be satisfied. The destruction. The destruction that ultimately is all, as we read in verse 15, the vengeance of God. Take vengeance upon her. This theme becomes a central one in these two chapters. We will add one additional dimension to the two that we've already noted. Again, the wanton cruelty and the egotistical pride. The final additional dimension being, as we read in verse 28, Hark, they flee and escape out of the hand of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of God our Lord, the vengeance of his temple. And this theme pertaining to the temple, indeed, we read in chapter 51 as well, in verse 10, God has brought forth our righteous acts. Come and let us declare in Zion the work of God our Lord. In verse 11, make bright the arrows, fill the quivers. God has roused the spirit of the kings of the Medes because his device is against Babylon to destroy it. For it is the vengeance of God, the vengeance of his temple. That while everyone, again, has a role in this unfolding divine drama, Ultimately, there is a plan, and there is a goal. Babylon will fall. The very last words of Jeremiah, before again the concluding chapter. In Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 64, And you shall say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise again because of the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. The end of Babylon. The end of every kingdom in this relentless succession until we get to the final definitive reestablishment of the kingdom of God. It's in this vein, likewise, in Ezekiel chapter 25, we read of the destruction of Edom, because Edom has dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance. Therefore, thus says God the Lord, I will stretch out my hand upon Edom and cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Teman. And once again, the succession. I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. There's this vast succession that ultimately resolves itself into the reestablishment of God's kingdom. Because until that point, as expressed so aptly in Isaiah chapter 33, there is going to be a relentless succession. Each nation, in turn, rising upon the stage and vanquishing its foe. Woe to you who spoils and was not spoiled, who deals treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with you. When you have ceased to spoil, you shall be spoiled. When you are weary with dealing treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with you. As if everyone in taking a role in this vast cosmic drama becomes on the one hand the instrument of divine retribution, and in its turn, on the other hand, the object of divine retribution, an ongoing process, the relentless battles of history, ultimately resolving themselves in the final, eventual culmination. And this note will conclude. Zechariah chapter 1. In verse 12, then the angel of God spoke and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have compassion 
on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you have had indignation these 70 years. And finally, ultimately, verse 14, thus says the God of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I'm very sore displeased with the nations that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped for evil. They had a mission, but they weren't faithful to that mission. With their pride and their arrogance, they turned their backs upon God. And once they turned their backs upon God, they turned their backs on the most minimal standard of decency and embraced wanton cruelty. I was but little displeased, and they helped for evil. Therefore, thus says God, I return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house shall be built in it, says the God of hosts, and a line stretched forth over Jerusalem. Finally, in verse 17, my cities shall again spread abroad with prosperity, and God shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. And this vast cosmic drama ultimately comes to its conclusion. One aspect in this story is, of course, the lesson of history. Nations chosen for their divinely designated mission. Nations choosing to play that role in the scheme of divine retribution. And by so doing, ultimately, making the choices that render them subject to the divine vengeance and eventual retribution that returns eventually against them. In the cosmic drama, the international arena, this relentless progression until ultimately there is the restoration of God's kingdom to God. And besides that cosmic drama, of course, inevitably, the implications with respect to each and every one of us. It is, of course, not just about Assyria, and not just about Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Edom, and all the other various kingdoms on the macrocosmic scale. Because, of course, it also pertains to the microcosmic scale. Each and every one of us each and every one of us is in the world for a reason. This to us is a truism. Because if there were no reason, we wouldn't have been born. Each of us is here as a result of a purposeful act of divine creation. Placed here by an intelligent creator who willed that we should be born where and when we were, and for a purpose. As we noted, what we don't have a right to choose, and indeed cannot choose, is irrelevance. We are here, each of us, for a reason. The great challenges in life is to try to discern, on some small level, what that reason is. But certainly, whatever it is, it is a mission through which we can, and are summoned to, ally ourselves with that vast divine drama. And in our own way, through being faithful to our mission, to take up God's side in bringing his will to fruition. It's in our hands. The drama is in God's hands, but the role that we play is up to us. By choosing well, by choosing the path of godliness, we make ourselves worthy of God's blessings. God bless you.